Um, we exist in this state of powerlessness, and I think that we don't even realize that we do. Because as a child, we're conditioned, right, to, um, I don't know, my big thing was when I was a kid, it was always, you know, be seen and not heard. <laughs> you're, you're, uh, what you have to say is not important, right? And so, um, and we tend to do that, I think, to children because we don't realize that they're learning and that they have um, a strength and a power of their own. And sometimes as adults, we get so caught up in who we are, we, you know, start beginning that process of conditioning, of taking someone's power away. So I'm going to talk about stepping into your power, the power that you have as an individual, as a created being, uh, as a divine human. So before we get into that, I just want to say a quick prayer. Um, divine Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to speak and share my own um, experiences and the wisdom that you've given me through it. Open hearts and minds that they would receive whatever they need to continue on their walk. So it is. So, um, I remember as a kid that uh, I always felt, even though, so here's the weird, the weird catch-22 for me as a kid, right? I was the oldest child of four, and my dad was military. So it was on me to always watch the siblings, to always make sure, you know, they weren't getting in trouble or doing anything wrong. And even if I wasn't in the room, right, and my two sisters would fight or something, I'd get in trouble. I could never grasp that concept. But then at the same time, I didn't have a voice to say what I wanted to say. So here I'm getting this, you're the oldest, and you have these responsibilities here, and this thing that you have to do with the siblings to watch them, and they learn from you, and you're an example. And oh, by the way, um, you don't really have much to offer to this conversation, so go in the room and play with the kids, right? Or sit at the kids' table. You know, I think like the biggest offense I ever had was when I was 13, and I thought, yes, Thanksgiving, I'm gonna sit with the grown ups. Woo! Head of the kids' table. What is that, right? I'm like, what? No, I'm a grown up now. I'm 13. Teen is at the end of my age. So I'm not a kid anymore. I've crossed over. But I realized over time, as, as an adult, I would find that there would be times when I'd want to speak up or say something or um, give my opinion about something, and I'd find myself not doing that. And then I'm a person of peace, okay? Pisces, a Pisces. So Pisces enjoy going with the flow but we want to do it in a peaceful way. So if the ocean gets too crazy or the rapids get too whatever, we go deeper into our little flow and do whatever it takes. So I would give away my power to keep that peace, you know? And growing up military, we moved around a lot. So I was always a new girl, getting picked on, you know? And the funny thing was, I'd be the new girl, and always, the ones who would befriend me first would be the boys. And then the girls would be mad because suddenly I'm taking their friends away. But girls just were mean, for lack of a better word. So again, more conditioning to powerlessness, right? Because I'm like, oh, you know, nobody likes me. I don't have a voice, I don't have a say. When my parents decided to move back here, when my dad decided that he was going to retire because my mom was sick, and in the military, you get to a certain level of rank, and the wife, if you have one, begins to play this social role. And that's where my dad was. He couldn't stay in the same rank that he was anymore because he just advanced too much. He was too intelligent. And they were like, look, you've got to go up to this or retire. This is what you have. He'd given 20 years. My mom was sick. They decided to move back here with family. Um, she had lupus, getting worse. So he retired, came back here. Well, I was so angry. 
because we had lived in California for six years, right? And I had established myself. I had a little bit of power. I had some friends. I had, you know, I was walking in Jeanette. She wrote stories. People thought that was cool. I was, you know, um, on the little dance team and, and whatnot. So I had made a little life for myself. And here my parents were going to uproot it. And I'm 17, right? My best friend's parents are like, well, you can, you can stay here for your last two years of school. Live with us, you know, here. Finish going to school. Work it out with your parents, whatever. No. My parents were like, that's not happening. They brought me here. I hated it. I didn't want to move to Pueblo because Pueblo was where I had my worst experiences of being picked on when I was a new kid. Like, so I was like, I don't want to live there. So immediately, any gain of power that I had, any voice that I felt I had just went away because my parents, you know, decided what they were going to do. Now, as parents, we always want to do what's best for our kids, but there's different ways we can handle the situation so that they still feel like they have some power. And so that it's not just, no, you're going to, you know, you're our kid, you're going to do what we say. When you turn 18, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> well, I was 16 and a half, so I wasn't to that place. So I became back here, and I slipped right back into that role and just kind of kept it, you know? And every time I, I was always, I'd never, like, take the lead in things even though I would want to or I'd get opportunities. I wouldn't do that. I couldn't figure out why. So in the last three years, um, I began to realize, God began to reveal things to me about how I was walking in this state of defeat how I wouldn't speak my voice, how I wouldn't speak my mind, how I wouldn't, um, you know, I'd get into a work situation where I was picked on again. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> Why is it that people feel like they can just talk down to me or, you know, um, walk all over me? What am I doing? What am I, you know, what, it, what, what am I giving off? What energy am I giving off? And so I remember it's in this time of worship and, um, very distinctly and clearly, I heard, well, you give them your power. Your energy says, there's no fight in me. There's no, I'm, you, you don't walk in who you are. They're going to treat you the way you're teaching them to treat you. You walk in a room with your head down, shoulders hunched in, timid, that's immediate. For powerful people or for people that are bullies, that's an immediate, oh, there's someone we can do, get to do whatever we want. Ask Jeanette. She'll never say no. Even though she's doing 10 things right now, if you ask her, she'll do it. And the next thing you know, you're the person that's doing, you know, this play on the praise team, delivering cookies, you know, trying to juggle your life, trying to work, and wondering why you're so tired at the end of the night and not getting anything done for yourself. So, this, as I began to walk and grow in this, I started exerting my strength and power. Now, I want to tell you, when you start to do that, especially in your family unit <laughs> and with friends and people who know you as the one that's not walking in your power, you're going to get some friction. And suddenly, what's wrong with you? Who are you? You have a brain tumor? <laughs> the best one was, you must be possessed. <laughs> I've had a brain tumor. I've been possessed. I must be doing some kind of drugs. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, yes. And, oh, 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 brainwashed. That was the other one. I've been brainwashed. I've been taken in a room, sat in front of a TV with a little swirly thing telling, and someone telling me, you have power. Well, you know what? That's not a bad thing to be brainwashed with then, right? And in the last three years, that's what I've contended with. And I'm like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me right now? Are you serious? I mean, and with a few people, I'm like, yeah, that, you're right. I've been brainwashed by God. So what are you going to say to that? Doesn't usually <laughs> kind of shuts them up a little bit. So 
I'm going to share some things with you that I've stepped into and I've started doing to help you also um, regain power or begin to walk at the level of power that you should be walking in by who you are, by who you're created to be, and also who you um, agreed to be before you were formed in your mother's womb. Because if God knew, was it Jeremiah, right? If he knew him before he was in his mom's womb, what he was going to do, uh, don't you think he'd know us too? I would imagine so. You know, we're all the same creation, right? So I went in and I defined power. Because I'm like, oh, power, power. What is power? Because you always hear it in these different, you know, modes of talk, right? Oh, he has power. The president of the United States is the most powerful man in the world, you know. Some movie stars have more power than him, that's what I would say, <laughs> right? So where does that power come from? And what is that power? So just in layman's terms, just plain old ordinary power defined is the ability to act in a particular way, capability, potential, authority. So that's power. It is ability to act in a particular way, capability, potential, authority. Which I thought was weird because I was like, wow. I thought power was going to be something like, you know, commander in an army, <laughs> leader. Well, no. It's your capability and potential to act in authority. Then I thought, well, where do we get that power? How do we get that power? You know, how does a third grade teacher get that power? Certainly not the degree that tells them that they can boss third graders around. Like, how hard is it to boss a third grader? <laughs> Pretty hard. <laughs> Pretty hard <laughs> in this day and age, let me tell you. <laughs> you know? Um, but they have a piece of paper. It says, you have the authority during this hour and this hour to lead and have power over these children, to teach so they'll learn, so they can be functioning adults in the world. And almost in any job, there is that. Managers, you know, police officers. It's everywhere. Everybody walks in a certain level of power defined by their job. What they do, that's still not who you are. Just because you're, you know, a third grade teacher, just because you're a mom, that's not who you are. It's a part of what you do. It's a part of your character coming out into the world and where you're walking and what you're bringing forth from inside out, but that's not who you are. So where do we get the power for who we are? Well, we're the images of the creator, right? So, okay, I look up image. Now, I didn't look up just only the dictionary term, but I also looked up the Hebrew word for it as well, because I want to know, well, what exactly is image? Because I always get the picture, so when I was a kid, and they tell you that verse, right? And God looked down and he said, you know, I'm going to create man. Let's make him in our image. I always pictured this huge, ginormous human, human man, right, up there with some different people behind him that had characteristics of us and everybody going, <laughs> right? And then the little mold came to life on the ground. That's how I always pictured it as a kid. And, you know, couldn't be too far from the truth. We don't know. We weren't there. Well, we were there maybe because we came into existence then, right? So image in regular terms, incarnation, embodiment of a deity or spirit in earthly form, a representation, a statue. What got me about the definition was a deity, image of a deity. So image still does mean deity, which is what God is, right? So then I looked at the Hebrew word. And I promise you this all comes together. This is important. 
So there's two words used within that scripture and two words to image within the Bible. Betzlem means three-dimensional representation, spelled B, little asterisk thingy, T, Z, E, L, E, M. Three-dimensional representation. So there's the physical. There's the physical. That's our physical image, okay? Then you have Akdain Zalam. A-K-K-A, D-A-I-N, T-Z-A-L-M-N. Representatives of God with all associated responsibilities, privileges, and the power, the authority, to serve with God's strength and every name and everything that he has. So we're basically mini gods. I mean, really. <laughs> it's like that same thing. You know, a couple get together, they have a child. They don't have a puppy. Usually what comes out of the mom is another little human image, which is the embodiment of both of them. It's human. So that's what we are. So that's where our power comes from. And we all have it within us because that's part of us. And I think we don't believe that. We're so, we're so bogged down in society in different agreements by somebody telling you, oh, you can't do that for whatever reason. You know, like for the longest time, it was crazy in the military. Women fought so hard to be able to go to the front lines because they could only be nurses or some secretarial thing or whatever, right? And I remember... Um, well, my dad was kind of talking about it before, and because it was a big deal when my dad was in the military, and I said, well, what's the big deal, dad? You know, why can't, why can't a woman, if, she, if, if that's what she wants to do, if she wants to go and, you know, serve her country in that way, why can't she? Why does she have to be a nurse? Why does she have to, like, who said that just because she's a girl, she can't hold a gun? and defend the country in the way that she wants to. My dad really didn't have an answer. Well, it's just the way it's always been. It's just the way it is. Women aren't as strong as men. Really? I beg to differ there. <laughs> I've seen some stuff where I'm like, holy moly. <laughs> right? But somewhere in society, the belief system came that the women don't have that kind of power. So if you take that agreement on, what are you doing? You're giving away that power. If we're all created equally, if we're all created in God's image, then we all have that power. It may be different in some, but it's still there. But we still walk in this, this defeat because we don't know who we are. And then when pieces of who we are start to surface, especially the ones that are the more powerful and we view them as causing us problems, we don't like it, then that becomes a part of ourself that we decide not to love or like, right? So that was me. So I, again, meditated some more on it. And I thought, you know, um, how do I do that, God? How do I start walking in who I am with you? And I remember hearing a teaching where... Um, there was a scripture where Jesus is talking about the two greatest commandments, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, all that. And then the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. And I always took it as just, you know, you got to love them. So, you know, I'm nice to myself, I guess. So I got to be nice to that person. You know, treat others as you want to be treated. But that's not what he meant. If you really read it the way that it's been brought up by some other teachers, emphasizing as, as you love yourself, it basically means you have to love yourself first, which is also following the first commandment, which is to love God. Because if you are an image of God and you're loving yourself, you're also loving God. And we're not doing that when we aren't loving ourselves. So that's the first truth. So that's the first thing you want to do is realize that truth. 
You are the image of God. You are endowed with every bit of power that he has. Jesus even told us himself, you'll do greater things than me. And what did he do? Commanded the elements, raised people from the dead, healed people, talked to dead people, rose from the dead, right? So when we walk in that power, we have to realize that truth. That is a fundamental truth of who you are. Your image of God. You have that power. We all come into this world unconditionally loved. We do. And there are those of us, yes, who may come into the world whose initial biological mom doesn't unconditionally love them but they generally get put somewhere where there is unconditional love. Babies are the greatest example of that because they get away with a lot of stuff. I mean, I remember when my son was born, I thought, will I ever sleep again? I love this child, but I really like to sleep. And I am a grumpy person. When I don't get my amount of sleep that I need, I wake up just mad. I'm just mad. My daughter's like that, but it's natural. She just, since she was a baby, she'd sleep, she'd wake up. I'd go in the room. You know, babies smile at you. You see them when they first see you. She'd give me this frown, and I'd just be like, come on. But my son, and my son, she's still like that. <laughs> my daughter is still like that. <laughs> I'll go down and tell her good morning. She's like, Mom, you do know you cannot talk to me in the first 20 minutes of my morning. Okay, she had a slight concussion once when she was um, cheerleading. And that next morning, she fell, she hit her head, whatever. We were going to go to the doctor the next morning. I go downstairs. I'm like, morning, Danae. She turned around and looked at me. Good morning, Mama. I was like, oh, my God. We need to get you to the doctor. Something happened because you are, I mean, and I literally was serious with the doctor when we got there. I was like, um, is that normal? She's like, well, sometimes there's a little bit of a shift. Yeah, you know, whatever. If it continues for a few more days, we may want to do some more. I was worried the whole day. Next morning, I go downstairs, a little worried. Open the door, wake her up, and she's like, Mom! I was all, yes! <laughs> <laughs> you know? But my son, he just didn't sleep. I mean, that child, I was like... I thought babies sleep 16 hours, but I still loved him. Didn't like him too much a couple of times, but I loved him. And he didn't do anything for it, really. Babies don't. What do they do? Eat, sleep, <sighs> poop. <sighs> and every now and then, if you're lucky, you'll get a smile, and then someone who knows a little better than you says, that's gas. <laughs> and you're like, dang it. But ba as babies, we don't know any different because we just know that love, right? And somewhere along the line, as people start teaching us, we start to think because they're teaching us or because our parent gets angry or something, they don't love us. So then we start to say, well, gee, maybe I'm bad. So then you start to not love that part of you and let it go. So you are the image of God, that truth. Secondly, you want to love yourself. Because again, like I said, we're the image of God. First commandment, love God. Love yourself. That's us. And it's not easy to do. I've been working on it for hmm, two years solidly, and I still find things about myself that surface that I'm like, oh, I hate that part about me. So it really comes into changing your thought patterns and your focus. Changing how you think about it. Get up in the morning, look in the mirror. Some of the neatest stuff that I've come across is called mirror work. And you look in the mirror and you find something. You can start little, right? Something that you like about yourself. And you speak it to yourself in the mirror and you watch yourself speak it and you believe it. And it can be as little as, man, I have pretty eyes. I have my mom's eyes or whatever, right? So you start with 
some physical attributes that you feel and believe so you can get used to that feeling, right? And always be thankful. That's part of it. You wake up, thank you, God, that I am me. Whoever she is, I'm getting to know her, I'm me. And then next, the most important thing out of this, real well, they're all important. But for me, this one was important. And this is where you'll start getting that are you brainwashed stuff or possessed. You set boundaries. <gasps> Not boundaries, what? Now we have no problem setting boundaries for our kids, right? You know, don't touch the stove, you'll burn your hand. That's an easy boundary. Stay away from the stove right? Or, you know, because we have good reason to set the boundaries. It's for their safety. It's to teach them, right? But we forget to set boundaries for ourselves first and then put it out to other people because we set boundaries for our own protection. Because if you don't, you might end up in a rubber room with the all tied up wondering how you got there, maybe not even knowing your name. That's extreme, but it has happened to people because they don't set boundaries. So you set a boundary for yourself. Today, I am going to say no when I get asked to run the Christmas party again because I am going to school and I am doing whatever else and I have three kids or whatever and I just know Today's the day. And sure enough, you walk into the office, whatever, there's talking, your boss says, hey, you wanna do the Christmas party? Can't. Now I don't like that word can't, because it always, it just gives off this vibe of like, you'll never be able to do it, but in some instances, it's perfect. Can't. My grandson likes to use that. Some kids usually say no. Right, when they don't want to do something. He's got his toys out or whatever, and I'll be like, Paul, come on, mommy's coming, daddy's coming, let's pick up your toys. <sighs> I can't. <laughs> like, yes, you can. This is how we do it. We're going to sing the cleanup song. But I can't. Yes, you can. Look, here we go, pick it up. So some things can't works for. Other things, you retrain them. I say, no, you just say, I don't like to pick up my toys. You still have to do it. But you do not have to plan that Christmas party and run it. And if you feel weird saying no to something outright, modify it. But set those boundaries. Because the yes man is not always the one that's <laughs> walking in power. <clears throat> and change your talk. Change your speak with someone. Set that boundary. Instead of telling someone you made me feel, you just gave them that power to control your emotions. Tell them, when you said that, I felt this way. That takes back your power. And that is a boundary. You can make the boundary of, I am not going to allow anybody to control my emotions. How do I do that? I gotta change my speak. I've got to not give them that power. My son used to always say, but my brain, my brain made me do it. <laughs> and I, you get in trouble, right? And I say, Derek, your brain does not control you. And then I realized how like silly that was because it kind of sort of does. So then I was like, okay, it's not your brain, it's your thoughts. Don't allow the thoughts to take over. If you know that you're not supposed to do that because I told you three times, that's your decision. You're just trying to not own. So you've got to make sure you take ownership in the whole boundary setting. I'm going to take ownership of what I do and say. I'm going to take ownership of how I respond to people. And then as you set those boundaries for yourself, you're setting them for others because they'll start to learn. Oh, you know, she's not going to take that anymore. 
Are you sure you're not brainwashed? No, I'm not brainwashed. I'm discovering who I am and I'm bringing her out. Amen. It's who I've always been, but because I allowed myself to make agreements with certain things. Oh, I'm a girl, so I can't have a voice here. A church I went to before here, women had no voice. If you didn't have a male covering or a husband or a dad or somebody or whatever. Oh, and you could only do children's church and women's ministry and drama. Be a secretary. And I would think to myself, oh, that's not what I read about Jesus. I even remember one time disagreeing with a particular pastor there and he told me, you shouldn't speak that way to God's anointed. And I said, well then don't speak to his anointed the way that you have. Because if you're anointed, so am I. That was some of the very first time that I would rebel against some of that powerlessness because the real me would come out and be like, no! And then that song, this 80s song by Twisted Sister would run through my head. We're not going to take it. We're not going to take it. And then I was being a Jezebel. <laughs> and I thought, well, she may have been pretty evil, but she was a queen. So she had power. Thank you. I think I'll pull that from it. So you're living in your truth, you realize it, you set your boundaries, you love yourself, you love yourself, you set your boundaries, and finally you speak your truth. Find your voice. Because when you do the other three things, it's just going to naturally start coming out. Yeah. And there's been times when I've said something and I'm like, oh, did I just say that out loud? Oh. Deal with it. I had someone tell me, because I said something and disagreed. Well, so you just don't care anymore? You just don't care what anybody else thinks? You just can do whatever you want? Yeah. In this instance, I sure am. Sorry. Find someone else to take advantage of, because according to my dad, you only take be taken advantage of as far as you let someone take advantage of you. And if you don't speak up, they're going to keep on doing it. Yeah. So I spoke up. You don't like it. I'm being selfish. Okay. Because I'm loving myself. So. Good. That's what you do. Find your truth. Believe your truth. Love yourself. Set your boundaries. Use your voice. You'll be amazed, just a few of that, how different it is. Even me, I've had people tell me, wow, you look younger. Wow, you look like a different person. I'm like, really? Cool. And started doing things that I wanted to do. I, remember the peace I told you about? Oh, suddenly there's more peace. I can be in a room of complete turmoil, and I'm like, in the middle. Peace. So I want to give you a little exercise to help get within yourself so that you can start finding your truth and realizing it. We're not going to do it very long. No music, no anything. What you'll do is you'll find a comfortable space wherever you meditate, your room, whatever. You want to make sure it's quiet so you might want earplugs. So you don't want no music, you don't want anything like that, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna go inside to the little silent place where you can actually hear yourself. And you're gonna close your eyes, take some deep breaths. So we're gonna just practice that real quick right now. Not too far, so everybody just get comfortable. I know we have a little bit of noise here, and obviously I'm talking, so you're not going to go fully there.
but I just want to give you a little feel of it before we close. So you take a few deep breaths. And as you're taking your deep breaths, you just want to let go of any thoughts, emotions, anything that comes against you being the image of God. Anything that you've been told you can't do. Because if you're the image of God, you can. You can create your own reality. And as you're going in there, let the silence take over and allow any feelings or thoughts that generally you know you would push down something that definitely goes against an old agreement that you can't do something for whatever reason and let that feeling take hold in that quiet place. And as you're in that silent place with it, say who you are. I am the image of God. Say your name within. I can do this. I will learn to love myself. I will find my voice. Or I'll remember that I found my voice before and I'm going to get it back. I'm taking back my power. And then just sit in the silence of you for however long that you can. And your body will let you know. Your body will let you know, okay, had enough twitch or something. And then just slowly bring yourself out, still holding on to what you've taken in. And in this instance here, when you're ready, just open your eyes. Remember that little feeling, that little bit of feeling that you just had for a moment, and you can find that again in your own time, in your own space. And it's better to do in silence this particular one because it really allows you to hear yourself and take control of that power. So for recap, See the truth of who you are. Begin to believe it. Love yourself unconditionally. Remember unconditionally. That means the parts of yourself you don't necessarily like because probably those are the most powerful parts that were stuffed really far down. Set your boundaries for yourself and then put them out to others and use your voice. Hopefully this has helped giving you a springboard. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my experience with you. You guys have a wonderful 4th of July if you're not staying for the second service. And um, I'm done. You are dismissed. <laughs>